Well, this morning I want to talk to you about a little topic that's a little different. If you want to go ahead and be turning with me, you can turn to James chapter 3. We're going to be looking at some scripture in James chapter 3 this morning. How many of you, I'm sure, remember some recent forest fires that we've had in this area? I know that uh, back in the month of October, it became so dry and, and just so, so brittle with the leaves and things and the woods and the trees and the mountains and the forest land that I know all around us, it seemed like that when you go outside, so many mountains were on fire, so many woodlands were being burned that you couldn't even hardly breathe for smelling the smoke. I know over in North Carolina where my daughter lives, they, had, uh, they, thought, they almost thought they were going to have to evacuate. The fires got so bad in their area. And uh, some of you remember probably even down in Gatlinburg. You remember the fires down in Gatlinburg? How bad it got? And, and all, it was, it was so dry and the fires got so bad. For, forests were burned, mountain land, uh, homes were destroyed. Uh, you know, those fires, they resulted in millions of dollars of damage. So many people. How many, anybody in here know this morning someone that lost a home in Gatlinburg? Yeah. Anybody know anyone that lost a life? It was, a, it was a bad time, you know, and you just kind of think about it. I don't know. I haven't been to Gatlinburg. Some of you may have been down in that area since the fires, Pigeon Forge, Gatlinburg area. But it resulted in million dollars worth of, millions of dollars worth of damage. Uh, lots of wildlife were destroyed, lost their lives. Uh, but most importantly is that there are many people that lost their homes. And many people lost family members. And some people lost their lives. And, and when you think about it, you know, I think altogether, if I remember correctly, it was a total of 14 people that were killed in those fires. It's such a sad, such a sad situation. I think we've got some, a video uh, or a slide, if you can kind of run that up. See, you remember the fires? This is kind of a picture from Gatlinburg, how the fires were in the woods. Can you imagine how bad that was? It was terrible, the kind of fires. This is a bunch of little different scenes and stuff around where the fires were so bad. You know, it's amazing. They caught two young people that were, I think, teenagers. And they had started the fires with a couple of matches up in the chimney top picnic area. And it's amazing that two little matches from two individuals could end up resulting in that much damage. And you know, I imagine when they first started the fire and they first lit those matches, maybe just kind of a little bit of mischief going on. Maybe just a little prank. Maybe just wanted to see how, you know, how, how far it went, how long it would take them to get the fire put out. I really don't think that those, those guys ever thought that it would result in as much damage as it did, and there'd be people lose their homes and people lose their lives. And it seemed to be just such a little thing, such a little thing, such a little match. It's amazing that it could do that much damage. Well, as we're going to look in James chapter, James chapter 3 this morning, we're going to see something similar in that situation. So if you'll look with me, we're going to talk this morning about how the Bible says that our tongue is fire. Our tongue is fire. So if you look with me in, in, uh, in verse, uh, verse number 1, the Bible says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers. Now that's not something you hear in the church very often, is it? We're kind of saying, hey, we need somebody to help teach kids. We're looking for some people to help us work in this ministry. We're looking for some teachers. Well, what's, let's read it in context. It was, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we shall stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what, what he says, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. So the Bible's talking about how, how we bridle our whole body, but it's going to narrow down itself into specifically what he's saying here. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we will guide their whole bodies as well. So, you know, any of you in here, anyone in here own horses? Yeah? Anybody ever ridden a horse? How many of you ever ridden a horse? Some of you need to get out of the house. You just nearly do. <laughs> ever ridden a horse? So, you know, when you get on a horse and you've seen it and you know how it works, they put a bit in the horse's mouth and someone who's sitting on there, they're able to pull the reins back, you know, whichever way you want to go, and, and that pulls on the horse and it, and it steers the horse in the direction they want to go. And so they're able to control the horse. That way. Well, some of us uh, have not learned that ability to control our own selves, to control our actions, and to control our tongue. And so, if you look at this, as we become teachers, my brothers, you know that we'll be, we'll be judged with a greater strictness. We know many of us are teachers, even though we sometimes don't even realize it, 
because we're around other people and we're teaching and we're influencing and we're making a difference and we carry that trademark of that name Christian and therefore by default we're a leader we're setting an example and we're teaching by the words we say and sometimes we say the wrong things when instead of being a witness to someone to lead him to the Lord we're kind of pushing them away if we're not careful did you know that Jesus said it this way and I love the way Jesus put things he didn't pull a lot of punches when he when he started telling people how things work and he said he said basically it's either black or white there's no gray area he said either you gather with me or you scatter abroad he said either you're for me or you're against me there's no middle road and so well, sometimes when the way we act the way we behave we're either doing we either gathering with him either we're drawing people to Christ with our actions with what we say with our words or we're pushing them away and I believe that's the way we we are from the time we get up till the time we go to bed every day as we're around other people we're being a witness and it's either we're being a good witness or we're being a bad witness and so as we read on look look at verse number uh, four the Bible says look at the ships also though they're, though they're so large and are driven by strong winds they are guided by a very small rudder wherever it will of the pilot where uh, the will of the pilot directs where the will of the pilot directs so you know, take a great big ship. And boy, some of these ships, if you look at some of the aircraft carriers and the size of those vessels, it's amazing. Yet there's this little small, this guy in there with a little wheel and it's steering this little rudder, two or three rudders on the back to, to turn that great big ship. And that's all it takes to steer it. And then we've learned how to do that. They control the great big ships. Except verse 5, it says, So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. You know, we've got our tongue. And, and our tongue is such a small part of our body. Yet, you know, our tongue can do more damage than any other part of our body. As there's some of you in here that probably work out. And you think, man, I'm getting, look at my biceps. Ooh, I'm strong. I'm getting big. I'm getting bulked up. And did you know, it doesn't matter how strong you get. You may get so you can bench press 600 pounds. You know, you're never going to be able to do as much damage with your body, with your massive muscles, than you can do with your little bitty tongue. The tongue can do so much damage. The Bible says that how great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. Read on in verse 6. It says, and the, and the tongue of fire, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, sustaining the whole body. Setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poisons. You know, our tongue is, is that fire, just like we saw the blaze that happened, the fires that happened in Gatlinburg. It's just two small matches were placed out in the woods, and they began to ignite. And that little flame that started out very small seemed to go out of control until it engulfed much of the mountain, much of the Great Smoky Mountains, all because two individuals, not thinking they were doing that much damage, probably not anticipating what all was going to happen, started a little bitty small fire, which just seemed like a little fun and game, maybe at the time, ended up killing 14 people. Thousands of people were displaced from their homes. Many lost families, loved ones, and it was a terrible time. And some people's lives will never be the same because of that. Because of those two people that ignited that little fire, people's lives will never be the same. And you know, that's the way it is sometimes when we're with our tongue. If we're not careful, we can make such an impact on people. We can do such damage, maybe not thinking anything about it. Maybe not even thinking that, oh, well, not that big a deal. What I said, you know, I'm just kind of sharing with people. I wasn't really thinking about it. Sometimes we get all upset about things that's going on around us, stuff that's out of our control and decisions that somebody else makes. And so what's our first recourse? I'm going to complain to somebody. I want to tell somebody about it. I'm going to, oh, I'm just so frustrated. i got to find somebody to tell. And for some people, you know what the word secret means? It means when I tell other people, i got to talk quiet. 
You know what that, that's what most people think a secret means, isn't it? A secret is not something you don't tell. A secret is something that you whisper when you're telling it. Is that right? That's the way some people seem to think that it is. Because if they know something that's a secret, oh, I've got to tell somebody. I'm just busting at the seams. It's like money burning a hole in your pocket. You just can't wait to find somebody to share that with and to tell them the great secret that you've learned. Did you hear about Pastor Chad? I mean, don't tell anybody else it's a secret. But I'm going to tell you. You know what he did? Did you hear about Pastor Phil? I heard the other day that he... You know what? What can be done with things like that? And it doesn't have to be that. Did you hear about Brian Owens? You know what I heard? Now, this may not be true, but I'm just going to tell you, this is what I heard. Is that the way it goes or not? Am I, t- am I right? I don't know what you did, Brian, but they all heard it. You know, it's the way we do. It's the way we seem to behave. And it's something we get caught up into that trap. And listen, there's not a one of us that are exempt from it. There's not a one that's exempt from it. Because this little tongue, the Bible says, we can tame the wildest of beasts in the field. We can tame the most fierce lion, the biggest bear or tiger or whatever. People have learned how to tame those wild beasts. But it's like nobody, the Bible says, has ever learned how to tame their tongue. It gets out of control. Such a little member of our body has just can do such great damage. Great damage. It's so powerful. You say, well, what kind of damage can it do? What kind of damage can it do? Well, it can wreck a home. Did you know that? It can absolutely wreck a home. Have you ever noticed how uh, the little tongue, it just kind of, it's like a razor knife and something can be said that hurts so bad? Why is it that we seem to hurt the person that we love the most is it seems seems like the person that we hurt the most with what we say with our words. I'd say, if how many of you here are married? How many of you dating somebody that you really care about? Now somebody started to raise their hand, and I said that you really care about, and they pulled it back down. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, you know, when we have that person that we really care about and we really love, and if you ask yourself, if you'll be honest about this, you've probably said things to them cruel, hurtful things that you'd never say to a stranger on the street, that you'd never say to a friend or a co-worker, but you'll say that to that spouse or that girlfriend or boyfriend. You'll say that to someone. You may say that to a brother or sister or even a close family member that you're close to. You'll share things with them. You'll say things to them that cut them to the core that you'd never share with a stranger. Why do we do that? It's because we can't control this little tongue. We get all selfish inside and, and, and we think about it's all about me and, and we get offended and, well, they're not going to treat me that way and, and we react and we hurt people and we do damage like with the fires that happened in the Gatlinburg area. We do damage that can never be recovered. We destroy things that can never, we do damage that never be taken back. And sometimes we impact people's lives in a way that they can that they're going to be changed forever. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 15, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Is that the way we handle things mostly? It's like, sure, I'm going to tell you. I, 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 really, I really hate to tell you this, but Glenn... Stewart has got on my last nerve, and I just need to get it off my chest. I want somebody to talk to about it. Can I tell you? Let me tell you what he did. Is that the way we kind of handle it sometimes? Oh, let me tell you about my boss at work. You probably don't know him. Oh, he's just, oh. And you know what? We can get into that mode, and all of a sudden, we tear people down, and for all you, you never know who's going to come in contact with whom. You never know what you say, where it's going to go, and then that person is just casually talking to somebody else. Hey, I... I got, you know, you're not going to believe what Bob told me the other day. It's, you know, this is in private, so don't go telling, sharing this with anybody else. It's just between us, but I just want to tell you so you can pray for him. And, and then you go, he told me that Glenn did this. And all of a sudden, Glenn, who God's ready to use in a great ministry for the kingdom of God, all of a sudden, we've destroyed his testimony. All of a sudden, we've drugged him through the mud and slandered him around. And by that time, I started it. I forgot all about it. I got over it. I got it off my chest. I'm, I'm okay now. It's not a big deal. I'm, I'm fine with Glenn. 
But now I've already drug his name through the mud and word has got around and one person's told another person and all of a sudden, if Glenn's going to do anything for God, he's going to have to move out of town because we've absolutely destroyed and wrecked his ministry. We can do that with Pastor Chad. We can do that with your, the person sitting beside of you. And we can do that with family members. So we get in and we do that with family members and we say things and we hurt one another rather than sitting down and having a talk and working it out and dealing with things and going to someone, as the Bible says, going to them and talking to them alone, we kind of like to drag it around. Also in Matthew chapter 18, verse 21, the Bible says, Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Now you think about that. If you and I are in the same family and or maybe not, maybe we're friends, maybe we're brothers, sisters, maybe we're cousins, maybe we're just, just acquaintances. And let's say that I do something to you that offends you, that hurts you in a big way. And you come and you tell me about it. And I say, man, I'm really sorry. I didn't mean anything about that. I'm so sorry. About 15 minutes later, I turn around and do it again. Hmm? And you say, hey, I thought you said you're sorry. You just did it again. Oh, man, I'm telling you, I, I didn't realize that. I am so sorry. And that thing seemed fine then. About an hour later, I turn, about an hour later, I turn around and I do it again. How many times do you think you're going to keep forgiving me? How long is it going to take before you start thinking like, uh, I've had enough of this? Well, what's the Bible say? Peter come and ask the Lord, because evidently somebody was getting on Peter's nerve. You ever think about that? Evidently somebody was under his skin. Now, I don't know if it was Judas or whoever, but somebody must have been irritating him. And so he said, Lord, how, how often am I supposed to forgive my brother? How many times before I just say, forget it? Is it seven times or what? And Jesus said unto him, I do not say unto you seven times, but seventy times seven. Or 77, 77 times. Can you imagine that? Most of us don't have that level of patience. But that's what Jesus says. So, it's the, you know, if someone comes to you and someone has done, done you wrong, and they say, I'm sorry, I'm really sorry, will you forgive me? To not forgive that person and to hold a grudge and to hold that against them, that's wrong. And all of a sudden, your problem has gone from being with that person, now you've got a problem with God. Because not to forgive someone that's told you they were sorry, your problem with that person's over because now you've got a problem with God because now you've just set up, you've just declared war on God. You said, God, I'm not going to do it your way. I'm going to do things my way. God, forget you. I don't care what your word says. I'm doing things my way. And the Bible says if we don't forgive others, neither will our Heavenly Father forgive us for the things that we've done. So our tongue can lash out, can say mean, hurtful, cruel things, and can ultimately tear our family apart. It can cause marriages to fall apart. It can cause division between mother and daughter, father and son. It can cause brothers and sisters and other family members to get to the point that they won't speak to one another any longer. Because something hurtful that was said. Because someone shared something that really hurt them and cut them to the bone. And maybe they didn't just share it with them. Maybe their tongue went and talked, said it to someone else. And they got news of it and got wind of it. And it hurt. And they've gotten to where they're not even on speaking terms. If you have that relationship today with a brother, with a sister, with a family member, or with a friend, I encourage you, go to them and make things right. You need to have forgiveness in your heart for what they've done. And you need to forgive them of it, and you need to go to them and make it right. So it can wreck a home. The third thing our tongue can do, the first thing our tongue can do is it's, first thing about our tongue, the thought, thought I want to point with you is that our tongue is a small, but it's very powerful. Secondly, it can wreck a home. Thirdly, it can split a church. Why is it that it seems like that if there's any place that we're going to become hurt, if there's anything, any place that we're going to go and be hurt tremendously, it's in a church. There's some of you here this morning that you're at this church today because you were hurt so terribly in a previous church. And you left, maybe you even stayed out of church for a while. Maybe it was all you could do to get back in church. 
maybe you used to come to this church and you you kind of you got to one point maybe that you had gotten hurt really bad and now you're you're back and you're hoping you can get over that and you're just struggling with that. You know, it's something like I think our home is one place where we go. It's a place we think of as a refuge. When I've been out in the world all day, when I've been battling with the world and, and the enemy's been attacking me, you feel like I can go home to my safe place, to my refuge. And so we let down our guard and we get hurt in the home. Same thing in the church. It's like, yeah, we expect when we go to Walmart for somebody to be mean and cruel and rude to us. We expect at work for somebody to treat us bad and, and do wrong to us. But when we go to church, we're expecting people to behave like Christians. When we go to church, we expect people to behave in a godly manner. And so we let our guard down. And we think, oh, you know, that's my brothers and sisters in Christ. They love me. And they're going to help me. And they're there to encourage me. And they're there to help me live my Christian life. And, and so I'm looking for good things. And all of a sudden we realize the people that attend church, they're people too. They're not perfect. The people who attend church, did you know even Pastor Chad's not perfect? Did you know that? What's that mean? We can all get our feelings hurt. In fact, I could do something to hurt your feelings and never know it. Pastor Chad could have hurt your feelings and you never knew it. There could be somebody here to say, well, you know what? Preacher, he just never will talk to me. He's rude. He don't like me. You ever felt like that? Or that, that lady on the other side of the church, I noticed the way she's looking at me. She's got a, there's something wrong. She don't like me. And I don't like her either. Do you know that? We get so many things worked up. And many times, though, something can be said. Something can be said. Not thinking. It's not right. But we say stuff not thinking. We let our little tongue get out of control. And it strikes that little fire. It's just small. It's not a big deal. It's a little fire. And all of a sudden, it starts erupting. And that fire spreads. And suddenly, that person is hurt in such a way that they leave the church. And sometimes they never get back in church. There's people that's out of church today because they were in some church somewhere and they got hurt. They got hurt in such a way because something that was said with the tongue. And now they're out of fellowship with, with church and they're out of fellowship with God. And it's a sad situation. It's all because their little tongue gets out of control. The Bible says in, uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth but that which is good to use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearing in James chapter 1 verse 26 it says if anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart this person's religion is worthless the Bible says and then in James chapter 4 it says do not speak evil against one another brothers Notice that it doesn't say, don't speak evil of one another unless it's true. Don't speak evil of one another unless it's in the form of a prayer request. The Bible says, don't speak evil of one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. You know, but we kind of... We kind of like, well, you know, we kind of think, we look, it's like we look for ways around that. As I said, it's like sometimes it's like, I'm just telling you because I want you to pray for them. It's just between us because, you know, I know that the role you're in uh, in church, that you're in contact with them a lot. So I just want to share with you so that you can have an impact on their life. You know, what am I supposed to do? If I know something, if I know something on Bobby, then I'm not supposed to go and tell uh, Joe... I'm not supposed to go back and tell John and say, you know, I know that you guys are, you know, you're around Bobby a little bit, and so I just want to tell you some things that's going on there with him that you probably need to know about. That way you can witness to him, and you can have a positive impact on his life. That's wrong. The Bible says don't speak evil of one another. But yet we kind of justify it. We try to put a little slant on it so that it's okay. But the Bible says no. If I know something about Bobby, I'm supposed to go talk to him. Me and him and to him alone. I'm not supposed to be sharing around with everybody else. I'm supposed to go to him. And then the Bible says if I confront him about something, if he's doing something that's in a sin, he's caught up in a sin, and, and I come and confront him about it and tell him, you know, this is something you really need to deal with. This is something that you need to quit doing. This is something you need to take before the Lord, and you need to seek repentance over that. And, and this is something that uh, is 
you know, it's not a good witness for you and it's not a good witness for our church because you're a part of our church. And I confront with him and consult with him and try to make an impact on him and that doesn't work. You know what the Bible says we're to do then? The Bible says I'm to go get a friend then. Then and only then am I to go get a friend and now we'll go back and talk to him. And now we're going to try to together. So maybe I go get a deacon. Maybe I'll go get, a, get, a, get another pastor. Maybe I get somebody in the church and I say, yeah, let's go, I want you to go talk to, uh, go talk to him with me and uh, we're going to try to try to make an impact. And if that doesn't work, then the Bible says I'm to go get the church. Now, can you imagine if the whole church walks in his house? He's like, what, what's going on? He may never come back. Then again, it might have an impact. You know, no matter what we do, if we do things God's way, if we do things the Bible way, then God honors that. And I've seen that done. I've seen many call that church discipline. And I've seen that done in practice. I've never seen the whole church go to somebody's house. But I've seen that done in practice, and I'm telling you, it is the way you turn problems around. It is the way that you make a difference in people's lives. And it's the way we're to function as the body of Christ. That's what God's Word says. So a tongue, our tongue is such a powerful, small thing that it, can, uh, it carries such power with it. It can wreck a home. It can split a church. And fourthly, it can destroy a testimony. Mm. It can destroy a testimony. And not just the person, the testimony, the person that you're talking about. It can destroy my testimony. You've been around people like this, haven't you? You've been around somebody where it's every time you talk to them, there's something to complain about. Have you been around that kind of person? Aren't they just so much fun to be around? Don't you just love it? You know, I'll say, hey, how's it going? Man, it's just so cold out here. I hate this weather. I wish it'd come summertime. I wish it was summer. I hate it. Did you notice that? Oh, it's just, have you noticed the carpet in the church? Oh, I just wished, oh, my car, I got in my car this morning, and that piece of junk won't even hardly run. I like to never got it started. And my heat pumps tore up, and oh, this morning I got to take a shower, and oh, that water was cold, and they're just so fun to be around, aren't they? Just so much fun, don't you? It just makes you feel good. Doesn't it? All those people I work with, they just, well, my boss at work, they just, oh, well, they're always trying to get me. Everybody's after me. Oh, the government's always changing things. Oh, if they didn't tax us so bad, oh, it's just negative, 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 negative. You ever been around people like that? They make you feel so good and get you so fired up and ready to go win people for Christ. <laughs> don't they? Makes you, you want to take a ball bat and hit them, don't you? Just take a, <laughs> ooh, just ooh been thinking about selling duct tape you know on the side you just put a piece right across their mouth and just you know our tongue can destroy other people's testimony but it can destroy my testimony and you know here I am if I'm I want to represent myself well as a Christian I want to represent my well as a child of God so that I can have an impact on people's lives in a positive way I want to see people come to know the Lord as their Savior and I want people to realize that being a Christian as a Christian, I should be the happiest person on the face of this earth. And for me to sit around and mope and complain and groan and grumble, the Bible says it's wrong. And yet, so many times we do. You can get caught up in that. Did you know that, that negativity is contagious? Did you know that? You come into the church this morning, you could kind of say a little something that was sort of halfway negative, not meaning a whole lot about it. And all of a sudden, that other person catches wind of that, and then they tell somebody else, but they're just maybe even a little bit more negative. And the next thing you know, it started to snowball, and all of a sudden, people were complaining and grumbling and moaning. It happened back when Moses took the children of Israel out of Egypt, away from Pharaoh, and people were so excited at first, and then all of a sudden, somebody said, have you noticed that those Egyptians are chasing us? I don't think I like that. And the next thing, somebody else said, you know, you're right. And they start telling the person beside them, you know what? This is, this is awful out here. We're having, to, we're having to walk and my feet's getting blisters on it. I didn't have this back at home. I'm getting tired. My legs hurt. My neck hurt. My back's killing me. I'm dragging this stuff around. And my wife back there, she's pregnant. And we're, this is awful. What are we doing? What, are you, what kind of mess did Moses get us into? And all of a sudden, somebody else said, look. Here comes the army. I see the dust. Where they're coming running through the desert. They're almost upon us. This is the worst decision we ever made. Moses, what's wrong with you? We had it made back in Egypt, and you come and took us out. We had garlic and onions to eat. We were just half living high on the hog. Working as slaves, making bricks out of straw. 
terrible life. Terrible life. But all of a sudden, one person started complaining, somebody else started complaining, all of a sudden they're mumbling and groaning and complaining, and they don't realize that God's got such blessings on their life. God has such a great plan in store for them. And it didn't just happen at once. Of course, that time, God ended up parting the Red Sea, and they went through on dry ground, and all of a sudden, like, oh, we're so happy for about five minutes, and then we're start grumbling about something else. You know, and that's the way we are today. Moan and groan and grumble. You know what an impact we could have if we use our tongue in the right way? The Bible teaches that one of the things we're supposed to do with our tongue is not moan and groan and grumble. We're supposed to give praise and thanksgiving to God. The Bible says in Psalms 105, uh, or 150, verse 6, it says, Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's what we're supposed to do with our tongue. We're supposed to give praise and thanksgiving to God. Something else our tongue can do is encourage and build up. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11, it says, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up. Encourage one another and build one another up. Man, I'm telling you, you just don't know how far a word of encouragement can go. You just don't know. You know, you can be at your lowest low. There's been times in my life that I have been at a low. I mean a low. I don't know about you, but there's been times in my life to where um, I really didn't think that uh, life was really much worth living. There was time, a time in my life when, well, when I lost my son, it was one of those times, and I just really didn't have a lot of desire to live, to be honest with you. I was pretty down. I was pretty discouraged. It didn't look like there was much hope. And you know what happened that made a difference in my life? There were people that came around me and started offering encouraging words. People came to me and started encouraging me and telling me how much they loved me and my family and and. And started offering words of encouragement that really, you just don't know what a little positive word of encouragement can say. There's been times when, when, when I've preached, and especially in my early days when I first began to preach, where I felt like, man, I really made a mess of that, didn't I? I really blew that. They'll never come back and hear me again. And really get discouraged and down. You know what? There'd be somebody come up to me after church maybe, or after the message, or maybe, maybe even later in the week, say, you know, you just don't know how much that impacted me, what you said this morning. And I might have preached a 30-minute message, I might have preached an hour-long sermon, and they come up and there was one sentence maybe I said that made such an impact on their life, and they come to tell me about it. And you know, you don't know how encouraging that is. Yeah, I should be walking by faith, and I should be, when I preach, I should be trusting the Lord that, God, you gave me what to say. And, and if people like it, that's great. If they don't, I'm, God, I'm here to please you, not people. But I'm going to tell you, at the same time, encouragement is important. I'm not saying that we lift people up. No, we lift God up. But we need to encourage one another. The Bible says that. The Bible says that we're, we're to encourage one another and build one another up. So, you know, you just think about that. How many times have you gone home from work and you told your spouse, what a difference they made in your life. How many times have you been home and you said, you know, you just don't know. After it been a hard day at work and all the struggles and trials and things I face at work, you just don't know what it means to be able to come home to you and just to hug your neck and love on you and see you here waiting on me. You know what an encouragement that is? Or maybe, maybe you're at home first and the other person comes in and you say, have you ever thought, that, man, you know, I know that you've worked hard all day. I know you're tired. I know you've had a, probably had a terrible day. You just don't know how much it means to me that you're willing to go out and give of yourself like you do to support our family. Or maybe that there's someone that you say, you know, you just don't know what it means to me when I see you at church on Sunday. Have you ever thought about that? There's people, there's people that I feel like that. I don't know that I do a good job of telling people. There's people that sometimes just when I see them at church, just seeing them and looking at them and they smile, maybe we shake a hand, you don't know what an encouragement that is that that person has on me. And you never know what kind of an impact you're having on somebody else when you walk up to them, even just putting a smile on your face and shaking somebody's hand and saying, it is really good to see you today. You don't know. You never know what an impact that has. I've heard testimony after testimony in my lifetime of people that were at the point to where they're ready to hang up, hang up life. They're ready to throw in the towel on everything. They're ready to just give it all up. They're ready to drop out of church. They're ready 
And all of a sudden, they came to church and somebody said one little something. That that person probably never realized what an impact they made. They said this one little thing to that person. And that person, it was exactly what they needed that impacted their life, that turned their life around, maybe that kept them from committing suicide, maybe kept them from, from dropping completely out of church. That one little thing. So I encourage you, let the Lord use you. Let the Lord use your tongue. When you're at church, when you're at work, when you're in Walmart, and that person is so rude to you, oh, man. Did anybody go to Walmart over Christmas? You're braver than I am if you did. Because I'm telling you, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if this is the Christmas season. It's a time of joy. No, it's a time to push people out of the way and get to that product before they do. And it's a time to grab that toy before they get it because it's the last one on the shelf. And it's time to fight over those things. You've seen people like that, haven't you? You ever been to the store and seen people fight over, over a toy? Over a doll? Over a PlayStation? Over a game? I've seen it. <laughs> it's crazy how people do. They're not exactly full of joy. What you ever think about if you get caught up in that situation, somebody's rude to you, somebody bumps into you, somebody jumps in front of you to take something out of the way, you ever think of what it would be like if you instead of getting angry, getting mad, maybe shoving back, maybe saying something smart, you ever think what it would be like if you really vested in them in such a positive way and to love on them? Or maybe if you go out for lunch after church today, and just so happened it might be that you get this little waitress or this little waiter that comes to wait on your table. And they come and they just set your plate down and, there, you need anything else? Maybe they set that tea down and say, here you go. Anything else I can get you? Or maybe they don't even wait on you much at all. Maybe they're kind of rude. Maybe they're kind of blunt. What's your first reaction? Oh, I'm going to talk to the manager. I can't, I'm going to, where's the, where's, the, where's the manager at? I need to see the manager. And you know what? It might be that that little waiter, that little waitress, it might be they just got a phone call from their husband, from their wife, from their boyfriend, girlfriend, and they just broke up with them. Maybe their world just been, maybe they just got a call and they found out that somebody that's really close to them has cancer and it's terminal. And they're trying to cope with it. Maybe they just got chewed out by the person on the next table that you know nothing about. Somebody ripped them up one side down the other and gave them the worst day they've ever had in their life. So they come by to your table and they're a little bit rude to you. And you get all offended and puffed up and like, well, I deserve better than that. And that way we do, that may be the time that that person needs somebody to love on them. Maybe that person needs somebody to pour into them and say, oh, bless your heart, it looks like you're having a bad day. Do you mind if I just pray with you real quick and just add God's, God's blessings upon you? It might be the time where you just take that person, maybe you give them the biggest tip you've ever given them and leave them a little note and say, I hope you have a great day today. I'm praying for you. You know, you never know when that person's up next to you and they're not behaving exactly right. You never know when that person kind of smarts off or they're kind of rude. You don't know what they're going through and you don't know what their day's been like. And so instead of, instead of slamming that person back with, their, with your tongue, instead of giving them a good tongue lashing or just being rude and mean, maybe the thing to do is to, to stop and think and say, you know, they must be going through something really tough today. The devil must really be on their back. I bet Satan's really giving them a hard time today. Or, you know, maybe they really need the Lord. In that. Maybe they need God in their life. And I'm going to try to make a difference today. I'm going to be positive, and I'm going to use my tongue in a positive way. And I'm going to encourage them. I'm going to exhort them. I'm going to try to help them out today. Or you take somebody who's having a rough day in ministry. And listen, if you step out, you know as well as I do, if you step out and do something for God then the devil wants to do anything he can to get in your way and to cause you some problems. And if you see somebody that's trying to live for the Lord, somebody's trying to live for God and do right, and do the things God would have them do, to talk to other people, to be a witness to other people, to work in the church, or whatever that may be, look for opportunities to encourage them, because I guarantee you, I don't care what they're doing, what position they're in, where they're at, there's plenty of other people that's trying to tear them down. So if you can find somebody that's trying to live for God, take a moment and try to encourage them. Lift them up and pray for them and just really offer the good words of encouragement. Because the Bible says that we're to encourage one another and build them up. And then last thing I want to share with you that our tongue is the thing that we use our tongue for is to share the gospel. And I've heard this my whole life. And it's somewhat true. People will say, 
It really not what you say. You just need to. You don't really have to talk to people. Just live the life in front of them. Just live the life. What's that mean? What's that mean? Live the life. And I don't tell them. So all of a sudden, I show up somewhere, and for all people know, I'm part of a cult. I'm a religious person. I might be involved in a cult. I might be involved in some kind of false religion. I might be tied up with something that has absolutely nothing to do with God. Maybe I'm a member of this of this. Uh, sorority or this fraternity or maybe I'm a part of this club or organization that requires me to behave certain ways or do certain things. Maybe that's the reason I am. How would people ever know why I behave the way I am? Maybe I'm just crazy. I've met some of them, haven't you? Maybe I'm just crazy and touched in the head. And that's why I do the things I do. Unless I open my mouth and I share Jesus and I share what's driving me and what causes me to live my life the way I do, it's never going to speak anything. It's very true that our walk talks louder than our talk talks. How we live our lives is so important. It is, don't get me wrong. But unless we open our mouth and, and share the gospel and share the good news of Jesus Christ and tell people how God's transformed my life. Through, through God's Son who came and died on the cross to forgive me my sins. God's transformed my life. He completely changed me. The Bible calls it being born again. Old things passed away and all things have become new. And, and if you don't know Him, you can know Him. It's not about a list of do's and don'ts. It's not about keeping rules and, 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 and things like that. It's about having a relationship with my Lord and Savior. And because I have a relationship with Jesus Christ, my life has been completely changed. And that's the message of the gospel. And that's the message we need to share with people. Yeah, we need to live a life because it'll speak loud. And when somebody finds out that you're a Christian, they're going to watch you. They're going to pay attention. They're going to see everything you do. They're going to look for you to mess up because it makes them feel better. And you will mess up. Just because you mess up doesn't mean you stop sharing the gospel. It means that you say, yeah, I'm human. I haven't arrived yet. I'm still not perfect. And I still sin. I try not to, but it happens. And it'll happen again probably. And I hope it don't, but it probably will. But still yet, I'm, I'm a Christian. I've been saved. My sins have been cleansed and washed in the blood. And, and I'm born again. And you need to be too. And you need to be too. Will you stand with me this morning? If you're here today and maybe that tongue has gotten your way maybe some things that we read out of the Bible maybe some scripture today has kind of convicted you a little bit and you realize you know I really didn't realize it but I've been letting my tongue get the best of me and today I want to put a bridle on it I want to bridle it with the word of God with prayer and with the help of the Holy Spirit I want to control my tongue that may be controlling it from profanity some people say, well, it's just, that's just, I'm just a habit of talking that way. Well, you better get out of that habit because God's going to hold you accountable for it. It's not right. It's a bad witness. It's a bad testimony. And if you're using God's name in vain, it's a direct violation of one of the Ten Commandments. And you need to quit. It's wrong. But maybe the biggest sin, I think, that we have in the church is the sin of the tongue getting out of control. It's the tongue hurting people, cutting people, talking about people saying things that drag people's name through the mud and hinder the gospel. And if you felt convicted of that today, for whatever that may be, I encourage you, this is a good time for you to slip out of your seat and make your way down to pray. Or maybe you're here this morning and you've never really been born again. You say, well, I had an experience when I was a child and I went up to get saved and somebody prayed with me, but, you know, I don't really know where I stand with God now. I, there's a good chance maybe you weren't even saved. Because the Bible says, here's the question. Here's the litmus test. The Bible says when we're born again, old things pass away and all things become new. Did that happen with you at some point in your life? Has there been a time when you surrendered to, to Christ? Not just to get fire insurance, to stay out of hell. Is there a time that you surrendered to Christ to make Him your Lord and your Savior? A lot of people want a Savior, but very few people want a Lord. Have you surrendered Him to make Him your Lord and your Savior? 
Did old things pass away and all things become new? If that hasn't happened, there's a good chance you've never been saved. You say, well, I'm not sure. Well, then all you need to do is slip out of your seat and make sure today. You can come down and say, Lord, I've sinned. I need a Savior. I want you to come become my Savior and Lord today. It's that simple. Will you bow your head and close your eyes as I pray? If you need to come for any reason this morning, when I finish this prayer, will you come? Will you come? Lord, I pray today that you're, you'll have your way, Lord, in the service. God, I pray that your word will have its way. And, Father, that you'll impact hearts and lives today in such a way that only you can. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.